welcome to the FEG Insight Bridge. This is Greg Dowling, Head of Research and CIO at FEG. This show spans global markets and institutional investments through conversations with some of the world's leading investment, economic, and philanthropic minds to provide insight on how institutional investors can survive and even thrive in the world of markets and finance. Today's episode is entitled, Podcasting for the Rest of Us and the Money Too. Podcasting is new for FEG. We had two client conferences planned for 2020 before the coronavirus hit. Out of necessity, we turned the first into a series of podcasts. But prior to this, we knew absolutely nothing about podcasting. So today, we are recruiting a veteran podcaster to help us. I'm pleased to welcome FEG alumni and creator of the wildly popular podcast, Money for the Rest of Us, David Stein. David will talk about how he got started, lessons learned, and thoughts on the current market. David has been featured in the New York Times, Motley Fool, Forbes, and U.S. News and World Reports. Today, we are excited to have him here on the FEG Inside Bridge. Welcome back to David Stein. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we're, we're excited. We, can, we need some help with this, this podcasting thing. And, and before we do a deep dive, we thought maybe we'd start out with the FEG year. So first things first, you often reference FEG, sometimes not by name, but your previous job. So for listeners, what did you actually do at FEG, David? Well, sure. So I joined FEG in 1995. It was a very small firm at the time, only 25 employees. And then I was there 17 years, so I left in 2012. And at a 25 person firm, we pretty much did everything. Everybody did everything. So I was an analyst, consultant, we did our own research. Then I became a partner in 1998. Eventually I was on our FEG executive committee for many years. I co-founded what became FEG's OCIO effort. At the time it was called Managed Portfolios. And so I oversaw those portfolios. And then when I left, I was co-leading the research group as chief investment strategist and chief portfolio strategist. So it was, it was a great, oh, I have very fond memories of my years at, at FEG and learned a bunch. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny, you, even uh, prior to this, your, your name came up. We were looking at a research report and I said, well, how, how old is that research report? And they Greg, it is so old that David Stein wrote it. I go, oh boy, oh, we, we need to update that one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, what are some of your, your favorite memories or, or lessons learned from your time at FEG? As a, as a young firm at the time, 25 employees, there's always been very low turnover, both from coworkers, partners, and clients. And so it's just, it's those years of being with colleagues and clients and the trust that you, you have in, in your fellow coworkers. And, and that, that's one thing I miss about not being with the firm is just the trust you have in your fellow partners. What I learned was just, we were all curious. And we were all trying to figure out how investment markets work, navigate increasingly complex capital markets. And so I, I really like the constant change. And that's, that's one reason I got into investing. Instead of having to move to the next job all the time, everything else was moving around us in terms of how markets were evolving. And so that, that was great. And, and the big takeaway from that is, is, as you know, you learn humility as an investor. And, and the reality is no one really knows what's going to happen. You know, I thought when I was an investment advisor that I had to know that like people were paying me to predict the future. And you realize that you can actually manage assets and allocate assets without having perfect foresight. There's ways to manage risk and to do that and make decisions and just recognize that, that we don't know and the humility that comes from that the longer you invest. No, that's, that's great. There's, there's definitely a difference between risk and uncertainty. And Sometimes you, you just have to embrace the, the uncertainty. And, and I thought that was, that was very well said. I, I certainly recognize I know a lot less than I, than I thought I did. And each year <laughs> I, I feel like I know less. Uh, it, it is a great, a great mark. So I remember the, kind of the day we, we were at a, at a partner's retreat. And he, he said, well, I'm just kind of going to retire. And, and we're all like, David, you're you're too young to retire. Like, oh, so you retire and, and, and do what? You didn't immediately uh, turn to podcasting. You retire. What happens next? Well, now, so I left in 2012 and I, I launched the podcast in 2014. I, I spent a couple years writing about investing. I There was a number of businesses I started, shut down because I 
was afraid somebody would hire me. I, I had been an investment advisor for so, for so long. I just, I loved investing. I just couldn't find the way that I wanted to continue to do it without, so I didn't have to manage assets and have that, that weight of that fiduciary responsibility. I was a guest on a, a, a friend's podcast in 2014. I realized that that, that was kind of fun because what I missed about FEG was the opportunity to teach, to go to an endowments investment committee and to just talk about investing and talk about our latest research. And so after that guest appearance, a few weeks later, I thought I'll just experiment. I'll launch a podcast. I'll structure it kind of like an investment committee, just not do interviews, do more a solo show, 25 minutes, talking about money, the economy, investing. And at the time, everyone was more and more people were getting smartphones. They had data plans. And so I saw a shift in podcasting. And so timing turned out to be very good as there were not really that many investing podcasts at the time. And so that that's what I've been doing since. So it's been six, over six years now. So did anybody listen to that first podcast? I did. <laughs> and, you know, a few family members. I, it, no, but it, it, it never went viral, but it, it grew steadily year to year. So now, you know, I'll get about 50,000 downloads per episode. So it's, it's, it's done well. So it's been, it's been a fun experience. That's, that's, uh, that's great. Now your audience is different than the audience you had at FEG, different types of, of investors. Can you, can you explain how you're, you're geared in your practice? Yeah. So I, most of, my listeners are individual investors. Uh, clearly, some are institutional. I do have some financial advisors that listen, but but by and large, highly educated. Ninety-eight percent have a university degree. More than sixty percent have an advanced degree. More than half have investable assets greater than a million dollars. So it it's a group of very smart, successful individuals who want to have a good understanding of the financial markets, and that's that's why they listen. And they're able to learn about money and sort of the inner workings of the economy, central banking, and, and ultimately how to live without worrying so much about money, having some knowledge so you, you don't spend too much time worrying about what's going to happen. You know, those are two different worlds. I mean, I, I know you've always been an active personal investor, but sort of how do you sort of wrap your, your arms around the differences between taxable investor and a tax exempt investor that has a infinite you know, lifetime. They should be around in, in perpetuity. So how do you sort of gear yourself to those types of, of topics and questions? And maybe help for the audience explain what other differences there are. Well, I mean, the biggest difference between you know, my, my audience and a typical institutional investor is it's their money in that your typical board member. I mean, they're concerned about their alma mater, but they don't quite have the level of emotion that they have when it involves their own finances. And risk is different. For an institutional investor, risk is typically, as you know, is measured by volatility. Whereas for an individual, risk is the personal harm that can be caused by financial losses. And they, as you mentioned, they have a very different time horizon. So sequence of return risk is more of a factor. The need to have some type of guaranteed income source. So their entire retirement isn't dependent on the whims of the financial markets. So, so those are some of the, the differences, but there are a lot of similarities. Now, asset allocation, focusing on, as an individual investor, we don't really think of it, but we are portfolio managers. So we allocate our assets, try to figure out what's the best mix. Diversification clearly is important. Costs are important, including taxes. And, and those things carry over from the institutional world. So your buddy invites you to be on his podcast and, and you basically say, hey, I can do this. So what do, you, what do you need to have a podcast besides having a great voice? I mean, do you go out and buy a microphone? What, what, what's the next step in creating that first podcast? Yeah, having a mic is helpful because <laughs> the, the, and, and it's surprising. The, the bar is, has, has been raised when it comes to sound quality. Whereas, and you could, in the six years of listening to my show, and a lot of people, will, because much of that content's evergreen, they'll literally will start with episode one, go through all 300. And, and you can see the sound quality improve. They might not notice it, but I, I notice it right away. It's like, oh, I can't even listen to some of the earlier episodes. So you just, you just get better over time. But mainly, I mean, what's so fascinating is anyone can launch a podcast. 
and the technology's there. It's easy to do. The, the hard part is, is finding an audience and finding people willing to share because this is not a medium that lends itself to search engine optimization or, or people finding it on Google. It's generally people telling their friends and family members about the podcast they listen to. I've listened to a bunch of, of your podcasts. You know, every day driving home, listen to another David Stein podcast. And you must be sick of you're sick of me now, I can tell. <laughs> I know they're good. They're they're very good, David. <laughs> you know, what struck me is is the the variety of, of different topics that you discuss. And it got me to wonder where do you get some of these topics? Are they are they questions from some of your listeners? Are are you getting your same ideas from the proverbial Wall Street Journal that everybody else reads, or you have different sources of information. How do you get great topics? Well, I get I get ideas from listeners, from members of, of my community, books I'm reading. A lot of it's the news, though. And when I do my podcast, I I don't have eight weeks uh, of pre-recorded episodes. I I'll prep for my episode on Monday. I'll record it on Tuesday and release that evening to premium members and the general public on. Wednesday. And so I do read the Wall Street Journal, but I also subscribe to four other newspapers as well as a number of institutional research services like Ned Davis Research, Capital Economics. And so anywhere I can get an idea. And if it just happened, if it's something that I'm interested in, I'll do it. And I don't know what my episode will be from one week to the next, but you know, one of, we can call it a competitive advantage is the ability to find a topic. If it's timely, I can record the episode and release it the next day. In fact, during the last presidential election, where we didn't know what the results were going to be Tuesday evening, I recorded the last 10 minutes of that week's episode Wednesday morning and released it that then. And so whatever intrigues me that I find, find will be interesting to the audience, listeners, that's what I do the topic on. I had no idea. I, I guess in my mind, I thought you had these things planned out for months and months, that that you have that much flexibility. That's that, that's. That's fascinating. If I may ask you, so you, you said you, you've gotten better. What, uh, what's been your favorite podcast so far and why? It, of my episodes, I don't yeah. really have one. It's usually the one that I'm working on that week. So I know that yeah, it's just whatever that week's topic is. So there, one of the, your, your prep questions was, have you left any like yeah. episodes yeah. On, on the cutting room floor? It's like, no. I mean, when, when you don't have a backlog of episodes, <laughs> Whatever one you're doing, you need to release it. So you have to get it into shape. I, I spend way more time now. I spend more time now than I ever did in post production. Uh, for a typical episode, I'll spend three hours. I might record the typical episode's 25 minutes. I might record 40 minutes of content. And by the time I, I'll spend three hours editing it. And, and you almost have to do that in podcasting just because, you know, with a lot of the big national media companies releasing shows, they, they're heavily editing their podcast. And so that's important. But I, whatever that week's episode, that's the most interesting to me. Interesting. I wasn't sure maybe your, your first one, or if there was one where you're like, wow, I, I, I nailed that one. I, I, I took a topic that I didn't understand, but I was fascinated or interested in. And by Tuesday, I, I had a, a podcast and it just, it just sticks in, in your memory. Well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly topics that I've learned more about and having done the episode. In fact, I'll mention one later in this interview when we talk about central banks that just never really occurred to me. So, I mean, there are, I get revelations occasionally having done the research and my views have changed in the six years. I'll, you know, I'll have somebody write me, they'll listen to one of the early episodes and say, you said this and, and now you're saying this. And it's like, well, yeah, it's been six years. People are allowed to learn things and to, to grow. And so that, that's certainly the case. Can you share you one know, of those learnings from six years? Can well, I, uh, yeah, for example, I, in the early episodes, I would have said that the, you know, when the government spends, that creates money. And when they tax, that destroys money. And, and that's really a simplification. No, because once you actually look at the mechanics, well, when the government, the government has, federal government has an account at the Federal Reserve where it is possible that the Federal Reserve, just like they're doing with the Bank of England, England can fund that account with their digital money and the government could spend it. The central bank can do that. That's not how it happens in the U.S. So, in fact, 
when the government spends, they, they have to spend money in their bank account at the Federal Reserve. When they raise taxes, it runs through that account. So it's more, more nuanced. It's just not necessarily as simple as government spending is creating money, government taxation destroys money. There's, there's more nuances now. And that nuance is probably more important than ever in understanding how that works. Well, it is, right. And, you know, I now know way more about central, how central banks works today than I did six years ago, because I've done numerous episodes on and I've, I've tried to walk through the accounting and then you watch. And, you know, over these past six years, central banks have been more, more forthcoming about how the monetary system works and what they're doing and the power that they have. Where they, six years ago, they wouldn't, you would have never seen a member of a central bank the Federal Reserve Policy Committee say that they have unlimited spending power, that they can create infinite money. They just wouldn't say it. Now they say it. When anybody talks about something being unconventional, you're, you're going into to surgery, and a doctor says they're going to try something unconventional, that, that's typically not, not a good thing. And really post-GFC, the Fed has been doing unconventional monetary policy. And it, but you're right. that it, It's important to understand that because I, I think a lot of us, and I, I would include myself back then, thought, well, gosh, they're, they're, they're printing money. It's, it's, you know, QE, that's going to lead to runaway inflation, right? Well, right. Because then and you realize, well, it, we haven't gotten any. So what, what's going on? What are they really doing? Well, you, you realize that, no, they're not, they're not printing money and sending it into the marketplace. They're creating money in the form of bank reserves that are sitting on banks' balance sheet. And so we, we talk a lot about, you know, what is it? And, and central banks have mentioned this, that when they make a loan or when a bank, commercial bank makes a loan, that is what creates money through accounting. It's yep. not, they're not trying to find reserves to go spend. I mean, they can always true up the reserves by borrowing it. And so there, there's these, in these topics I find fascinating, just how the commercial banking system works. And, and it, it's somewhat mind blowing when you realize this is how it works. And that's why trust is so important because it is, there is, there are money trees out there where money can be created, but there's also constraints and limits. I was going to ask you this question a little bit later, but since we're, we're on the topic, the Fed now. So, so as we think about where we were, uh, we kind of had the first step of unconventional policies with, you know, QE. You know, one, two, and QE infinity inching their way towards potentially uh, trying to raise rates at least a, a little bit here and try to get out of some of this. And then the pandemic hit, and we're we're kind of we're kind of back back into it. What lessons from the previous period can we use for this current period? And are there diminishing returns on what they can do? Is it, is it truly unlimited? What, I mean, what are your thoughts, given all of the time you've spent studying the Fed? How should we interpret their actions now uh, on, for, in terms of investments? Well, they do have unlimited ability to create money, but the constraint is, do people want to accept that? That the dollar is a non-interest bearing Federal Reserve liability. That That's all it is. And so they can create it as much as they want, but I did an episode a few weeks ago, episode 295, where I talked about, could the Federal Reserve go insolvent? And this is an example of just something that, that had never occurred to me. I looked into the work of an economist with the London School of Economics, Ricardo Reese, and he, he said, insolvency of the central bank is not just theoretically possible, it's also a frequent, it's also frequent in practice across the world as attested by multiple currency reforms that have taken place. And, and it had never occurred to me that commercial banks that have all these reserves from the, from the central banks could decide we don't want them anymore and trade them in for dollar bills, for cash. Now, I don't know if they would or not, but they could. And that, if you take these reserves that are locked at the Fed and converted them to actual dollar bills and that started flowing into the economy. And so it all comes down to trust, the trust that citizens have in the central bank, the trust that commercial bankers have in the central bank. And so when you see the Federal Reserve buying non-investment grade bonds or, or non-investment or basically buying bonds, including some non-investment grade, those that have been downgraded, 
and, and realize, well, what would happen if default rates spiked? And you see how leveraged the Federal Reserve is that they could go in and solve it. And then what happens? You know, does the federal government replenish their capital? Do people panic? And so there's all these un uncertainties and unknowns, but recognize that federal, the central banks have a huge amount of power, but they're not infallible. There are constraints. And ultimately, if people don't trust them, then their behavior changes. And that's what can lead to inflation, capacity constraints, and, and a devalued, devalued currency. A few of your podcasts, you mentioned gold. Is the work that you've done on this led you to include gold in some of your portfolio allocation recommendations or just generally what's your view on gold as a, a hedge to currency? Yes, yeah, so, so about 5% of my net worth is in gold, uh, primarily in gold coins. Uh, one of FEG's colleagues, uh, Mike O'Connor, taught me a lot about gold and, and I used to be negative on gold and, and spent more time looking at it and then realized that no, this is, an, this is an asset, a speculative asset that's been around for millennia and it's a way to diversify a currency exposure. And so I, yeah, I recommend, you know, I don't include gold in my actual model portfolios from, because those are basically public markets, but I encourage members to have assets outside of traditional financial markets, including gold as an inflation hedge or just an, a hedge against uncertainty. Also in cryptocurrency. So having, there's ways that you can diversify away from the dollar, including having international stocks that are not hedged into the dollar, but gold hitting record highs this year. And it, it's an interesting asset class because if somebody's bearish on gold, they always compare it to, well, it hasn't done much since 1980. And you realize, well, 1980 was a bubble to the extent gold can be a bubble. I mean, it was clearly the top, but if you look at gold since the late sixties, on average, it's increased 5.7% per year. And this is some data from Ned Davis research. And so it, it's not a great inflation hedge because a true inflation hedge would protect you immediately, like tips, right? It, there's a direct connection to inflation with treasury inflation protection securities. But with gold, it can go through periods where it doesn't keep pace with inflation. But, and so it's not a perfect hedge, but over the long term, it has maintained its value and actually grown on a real net of inflation basis. You know, that, that's interesting. And certainly gold is one of those assets that are under-owned on the institutional side. It seems to be more, more prevalent with high net worth. The same can be said for Bitcoin. And so you may see institutions on, on the private equity side or venture, really venture side, investing in some of the technology, the blockchain technology, but not really owning Bitcoin. So I, I'd just be, be curious on, on your kind of views on you know Bitcoin as as a investment. Right. So I've I have followed and, and owned Bitcoin really since 2013. And unfortunately I, I sold some most <laughs> a couple of years later before it really took off. So it's something that I've monitored, but it it's a form of digital gold. And it's like any asset like gold. You know, gold, there isn't a way to value it. There is no income. It's worth whatever investors and speculators are willing to pay. Gold has an advantage because it has earned that trust over millennia. Bitcoin's been around for you know, about 10 years. And so people own it. As, and it's fascinating. You can carry on your phone tens of thousands of dollars worth of, of, of cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin and, and send it immediately. So it has some advantages, but it will only work if people actually trust it. And just like it, the same with fiat currency, it works based on trust and it's earned that trust. It's extremely volatile, but it's something that I own just as a, a speculative hedge, a couple percent, two, three percent on my portfolio in Bitcoin, Ethereum and, and some of the other cryptocurrencies. It's not something that I would put a ton of money in, but certainly something to, to keep an eye on just because of how fascinating it is and, and the technology behind it is equally as fascinating. 
Thanks for sharing that. I, again, I, I think that is that is very interesting. Are, are there other sort of non-traditional investments that you follow or, or recommend to, to your clients? Well, there, there's some that, like in the institutional world, I, I remember once we had a an FEG client. It was a, a new foundation that had spun out of a healthcare organization. And so the investment committee was made up of primarily people tied to the insurance company. And I think at the time we did the only preferred stock manager search ever at FEG, the first convertible bond manager search ever at FEG, and as well as some other asset classes we don't typically use. And, and you realize that for an individual, I mean, there are elements that, you know, as individuals, we're not allocating huge pools of money. So we have flexibility to go into some of these asset classes. We can buy a preferred stock issue that, that got beat up in this sell-off and, and buy some sort of, they are traditional asset classes, just not heavily used in the institutional world. And so those, those would be some examples. I preferred stock being a primary example. Definitely, those, those certainly aren't as well trafficked on the institutional side. The, the, the other thing that as individuals that we have the advantage of is, is closed end funds. I, I know, Greg, that's something that you worked in, with in the early years of your career. Yep. And, you know, it dumbfounds me. And, and one reason I spent a lot of time educating individuals is so many, when they first get into investing, the, the first thing they get involved in is trading Forex or options. I mean, sort of, and it's amazing. Like, what other field do you get? a little bit of training and suddenly you're competing against professionals trying to trade options or foreign exchange. Whereas if you want to trade, why not trade closed end funds because primarily held by other individuals. It's one of the things that I talk about in my book is who's on the other side of the trade. Who are we trading with? And closed end funds is it, I mean, you can see the inefficiency when you see a closed end fund selling at a 15 to 20% discount to net asset value. And so that's something else I spent a lot of time, teaching about and, and people can, I share on my membership site what I own and all the trades that I make just because I think it's important to be transparent. But I, as part of that, I, I definitely talk about closed end funds. Yeah, no, the, that's a, certainly a, a sleepier market. And, and yeah, sometimes for active management, you, you want those less efficient markets. You don't want to be competing with machines or hedge fund managers. You know, other retail investors might be the uh, might be not as probably not as, as sexy, but uh, you can make a lot more money, and that's certainly the goal in, in any of these exercises. Well, right. I mean, why why trade in forex when you can trade in something that yields eight to nine percent? Exactly. At least while you <laughs> you're learning, you're you're picking up some even income. As you look at the markets now, and there's certainly a, a lot a lot going on. You know, out, outside the Fed, maybe they make a policy error of some sort. What are some of the other big risks that 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 you're worried about right now? Well, the COVID-19, the, yeah. the pandemic, one of the things that I do, and, and I did at FEG, you know, as, as part of my chief investment strategist role was to do a regular market commentary. You know, since leaving, I do a monthly investment conditions report where I'm looking at economic trends, valuations, and some market internals or technicals and, and rate them red for bearish, yellow for neutral, green for, for more bullish. And in, that, in my case, overall investment conditions have been red since early March. And you know, once the Fed started to be more active in terms of what they're buying, we've slowly been adding back risk. But this has probably been the most challenging investment environment that, that I've seen since I've been investing, mainly because of the uncertainty of, of COVID. How, when, when we first started out, we didn't know. We, we literally didn't know how bad it would be. And one of the principles that I follow is, is called the precautionary principle. And, and the first rule of that is in the face of extreme uncertainty, take preventive actions to avoid ruin. So I reduced risk in my portfolio in early March, as well as in the models that I run. And then slowly as we, learned more about the, the disease, such as the infection for mortality rate or fatality rates not as high as was first thought. And watching how federal governments in terms of their fiscal response and central banks slowly adding back more risk, 
But the biggest concern is that the, the virus mut mutates, becomes more deadly. The recession is much longer and deeper than anyone expects. And so that, that's a concern for me, a loss of trust in institutions, the central bank, the, the federal government, I mean, the whole political process and just how disheartening it is in terms of the sheer anger both sides have and the, the lack of belief in, in it, it just dumbfounds me how people don't seem to want to believe anything anymore. And, and so far that hasn't impacted investment behavior, but it eventually could where people started hoarding and you started getting, a, you know, real fear regarding the dollar and it starts to fall. And, and these are things that I think are remote, but they're, they're very real risk, which is why I think we should have some currency diversification, own some gold, own perhaps some cryptocurrency, own assets that are apart from the financial system, private capital assets, own some land as an individual just so you can be protected against who knows what may happen. Yeah, th those are, are certainly not probable, but they're possible, right? So you, you have to have that scenario in, in your investment playbook. Broad diversification is always, always a good thing, but what you just explained, maybe canned goods should be part of that too. That was, that was a, a, a pretty dire uh, assessment of things you're, you're, you're worried about. I uh, certainly, can uh, sympathize. I love watching the news, but it is it is hard to watch the news these days. A lot, certainly a lot, a lot going on. Well, can well, the, the can goods is something. I <laughs> I was back in Cincinnati in mid March for a, a, a funeral, and and that was it was on that flight back. What it, it suddenly hit me how severe this pandemic could get, and, and I'm even questioning questioning why am I on an airplane? Like, what, what are we doing? I mean, if it hadn't been for a close family member that passed away, we wouldn't have been there. But going to Kroger in Madeira <laughs> that weekend and seeing the shelves bare, and, and, you really, and I've been to countries where the shelves are bare like that. Cuba, for example, and Italy often was like that. And you realize that, no, that there's, who would have thought toilet paper? Would, <laughs> would, there'd be a run on it. And so, yeah, having some food storage somewhere, I think all of us have learned that the, the, the system can be break down very quickly. And then you get people panicking and then it breaks down even more. And that those are remote, but we saw it happen. It's it certainly, I think as individuals and as corporations, we're moving from you know, just in time to just in case. And that's certainly gonna have uh, some, some broad implications on on markets, right? The supply chains and, and every, everything else. Those are certainly some, some important thoughts there. So you're podcasting once, once a week. Do you ever listen to the competition? Well, I don't have a commute. So having a long commute is really good for listening to podcasts. So I, I don't listen to that many. But I mean, there are a few that on the investing side, I have enjoyed Jim Grant's current yield podcast. I'll, I'll listen occasionally to the Sherman show, which is a podcast that double line does. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the investors podcast is, is another one I listen to is Dick Broderson's a good friend of mine. So those are some on the investing side. I have always enjoyed the work of Seth Godin. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very, very good marketer. His podcast is called Akimbo, A K I M B O. So that, so those are a few that, that I listen to and, and very much enjoy. You'd also mentioned you, you wrote a book. So not only are you a podcast, but you're an author now. What are some of the lessons that you're writing about or things you're trying to teach the reader in your book? For sure. The, the book came out last year. It was published by McGraw-Hill. It's called Money for the Rest of Us, 10 Questions to Master Successful Investing. And it was really geared toward individual investors to, to teach them how to think like a portfolio manager. Recognizing a portfolio man manager compares different investment opportunities and, and allocates those among different assets or, or decides you know, you know, how to allocate this pool of money amongst those different investment opportunities. And, and the key aim of the book was to teach a framework for doing that, a good process. And, and we've seen this as we've researched and FEG's researched managers. 
that those that tend to do well have a very disciplined investment process. And we should have that as individuals. And so I walk through 10 questions that every investor should ask before they invest. And the first one seems obvious, but people don't do it. And that's what is it? To be able to describe to a friend or a colleague, you know, here's this investment, here's the risk, here's how it works. We often just kind of plow into an investment without really stepping back and like the question I mentioned, who, who's selling me this asset? Who's on the other side of the trade? These are important components. And so having that framework before we invest in something, it's very important. And that's what I try to teach in the book. That's great. Yeah, we, we uh, I mean, even on the institutional side, I think everybody wants to believe in magic. And sometimes you get caught up on these great ideas. And it's really important to kind of back up and say, what, what am I investing in? Why will it work? Who's selling me this? Those are all really, really important things. Any, anything else um, of the 10? You don't, please don't, we don't have enough time to go through all 10, David, but is there a couple more that, that uh, you want to share with us? Well, I, I, another one is, I mean, some obvious ones is what's the upside. So understand what the return drivers are, what's the downside, you know, what is the risk and, and how is that risk being measured? I think another important question is to just what has to happen for this investment to be successful? You know, is it depending on forecasting ability or is there something underlying that could lead to this investment to be successful even if something doesn't work out? And that's why I, I like investments where there's cash flow. I, I think that's an important component. Uh, another question is, is to ask, it's the second question, is it investing, speculating or gambling? And the, an investment is something that has a positive expected return usually because you can value it and there is a cash flow component to it. Whereas a speculation is where there's some disagreement between whether the return will be positive or negative. And gold is an example of that. And, and then a, something would be gambling if, if it has an expected negative return. And, and, and you do that to be entertained. You go to Vegas to be entertained because it has an expected negative return. But oftentimes there are asset classes, a brand new investor that's trying to trade binary options is going to have a negative expected return due to their lack of knowledge, due to the being taken advantage of. And so it's important to kind of break investments into these broad categories and spend most of our time trying to understand investing investments. What's the expected return? What has to happen for us to be successful? Understand the fees. And, and so those are some other examples of the questions in the book. Gotcha. You know, I've always known you to have a very eclectic reading list. So, what are you reading these days? Maybe give us a few, some of your, your favorite investment books and maybe a few non-investment books that are just you know, good to get the mental juices flowing. Well, this summer I'm reading Middle March by George Eliot. So I mean, that's kind of been, I've, I have found myself and I've always read sort of classic novels and this is one I just hadn't read before, right. but from the investing standpoint- like that's March, of, right? To, to get through it? Yeah, I'm getting there. I mean, you know, I'm probably two thirds <laughs> of the way. Right. I mean, I've not watched the movie. I'm sure it's come out in a, a movie multiple times. So I have no idea what's going to happen with the book. But this is a book written in, I think, 1870. It talks about life in the UK in, in the 1830s. And you realize how you know, people in the 1830s thought they were on the cutting edge. And, and you realize the themes that are covered in that book are the exact same themes that, that happen today. We just have faster cars than they did. But other than that, so there are some things that you, I can learn from books like that. From the investing side, a couple of books that stood out this year that I've enjoyed. One was Robert Schiller's latest book, Narrative Economics, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Changes. And, and that, and I've always been an investor that you realize how much narratives do drive the financial markets. You, if you do this long enough, you realize that things, there's fads that come in and out and stories we saw this in the great financial crisis. It, it was probably a year or two in and suddenly Europe and what was going on with Europe and the Euro became the big worry. Whereas a year before it wasn't, not, not, nothing had changed. It's suddenly this is the worry that's in vogue. And that's one of the things that worries me. You know, what, what happens when people start to worry, really start to worry about the central bank? or the dollar and start to act on those worries. And that, that's an important component. Also like the, the rise of carry, uh, the dangerous consequences of volatility suppression. It's a book that came out 
earlier this year by Tim Lee, Jamie Lee, and, and Kevin Coldiron. And then last year, I really liked Alice and Schrader, Schrader's book. She's an economist. It's called An Economist Walks Into a Brothel and Other Unexpected Places to Understand Risk. And so that, that was a very good book on, on risk. Those are some good ones. How about your, uh, maybe for folks that are just looking to, to read the best investment book, what, what are a handful of your favorite all time? Not maybe not recent reads, but favorite uh, of all time. Probably the one that, well, there's two that stand out. I really like The Wisdom of Finance by uh, Mahir A. Desai that came out three or four years ago, as well as Adaptive Markets, Evolution at the Speed of Light by Andrew W. Lowe. Those, both of those books really took deep dives into finance, particularly Lowe's book on how markets have evolved. And it's really an extension of modern portfolio theory that modern portfolio theory is good. It has flaws, but at times there's other ways to look at it. And that, that was a very, very helpful book. What you, your reading ends up in, in your blogs. Is it, is it more for fun or does, does it really help you kind of think through some of these different topics? No, it definitely helps. I mean, most of the books that I read somehow ends up in, in my podcast at some, it might even be a, a side note. So I, I do, you know, I read a lot of East Asian philosophy. So I've done a lot of classic episodes on just early Japanese writers. And so I, anything that happens to be interest that I'll read it. And if it's appropriate, I'll, I'll share at least part of it as part of a podcast episode. Cause I, I try to make the, the podcast more narrative driven and try to interweave different topics or elements just because, and I saw this even, you know, at FEG using analogies and metaphors really helped clients understand the financial markets better. Yeah. We, we all, uh, we all seem to process stories a lot better than numbers, which, to your point about narrative, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, sometimes right. those, those are false narratives that, that lead us to uh, the, the easy one. But yeah, you, you, certainly, you certainly bring in, in a lot of different stories, and, uh, which I think probably people appreciate and, and find your podcast to be very you know, you know, interesting, right? Not just the, the dragnet, just the facts. You're, you're throwing in some very... Um, sometimes obscure references in, in, in your, uh, in your podcast. Well, you're right. I mean, it, this is not a podcast where it, it's, it's four bullet points. And, and, you know, you, sometimes you look at negative reviews and, and people, a you know, negative review is like, well, uh, he didn't use five, five bullet points. He, why did he tell that story? And you learn, and that's something I've learned over time is, is to, you know, sometimes the right story doesn't belong. So I, I do cut stuff. I mean, an example of something I cut and I should sometimes share this story, but it's like we bought a camper this year and we're out in the middle of, out by the Salmon River. Nobody's there. Laprell and I are there alone and it's 9.30 at night and we lock the keys in the car. And this is a 2002 Suburban. I mean, there, there's no fob, like the, the, the car is locked stranded. What do you do? I, I, you can't, you, there's no cell phone coverage. You can't call a locksmith. So, you know, we took a rock and we, we threw it through the window to get into our vehicle. Now there's an analogy there. There's a metaphor there. I haven't, I didn't use it in that episode because I just couldn't find a connection to the investing market. So sometimes just not, it's good to have stories, but just telling a story for good story's sake, if there's not a point to it, then it's often best to leave it out. Definitely. You mentioned feedback, maybe some, some criticism. We live in this social media world, which it's good, right? Because it's offered you a whole nother medium, a whole nother career. It's easy for you to get out there and people are, are like, generally liking what you're doing, but it's also really easy for them to criticize you. And so it, it cuts, it cuts both ways. How do you deal with that? Is that, is that, does that, that used to bother you? Does it not bother you now? I mean, what's, what's the general feedback and how do you deal with it? You know, occasionally I look at podcast reviews. I don't spend a lot of time on it. I, I, there, are, there is constructive criticism and, and I'll take that to heart. I mean, I, I had a guy that spent, he had a podcast reviewing other podcasts and spent 30 <laughs> minutes <Really>? just <laughs> critiquing my podcast. It was brutal. But I listened to it, and, and one of the things that he mentioned, he, 
he says he has a lot of mouth noise and, he, and he's a breather. And I thought, huh, well, maybe I should <laughs> look at what he's talking, first figure out what that even means and find a way to fix it. And I hired a voice, a voice coach and spent more time thinking about, well, what is, what did the audio sound like? You know, is there white noise? Is there t- too much breathing sounds? And most of we don't, we don't notice it. I mean, we all breathe, but you realize that we, we, we can tend to tune that out, but you can always be improving. And so, but there's other venues where like I did YouTube for a while and finally gave up because the comments there were just mean, right? I mean, they're not helpful. Like I, I like constructive criticism, but if YouTube podcast reviews are, are way nicer and more helpful than comments on YouTube. And the problem with YouTube is you're so dependent on that algorithm that you have to interact with those comments in order to grow your channel. And I finally gave up. It's like, I'm just not, I don't want my business to be dependent on YouTube's algorithm and having to interact with, with inane comments that I just like, this isn't even worth a a reply. (laughs) You have a better uh, educated uh, clientele podcast world is that kind of what you're, you're getting towards? well that's part of it and i just people like to just troll for fun on youtube and like i i mean i still have videos up there that gets you know tens of thousands of views they have hundreds of comments i just don't even look at them because the comments haven't changed they're still and they're they were controversial topics i mean they were there was one was on monetary modern monetary theory or mmt another one was on you know dollar crashing and, and things like that, that, that tend to be a little more political. And so it bring out the, the knives, I guess. Is, is that helpful to, uh, if you're choosing a topic, do you want it to be controversial or, or timely? Are those kind of the, your two big levers that you'll pull to get listeners? Well, my approach is like, I, I'm, my podcast is not political. So I, I you know, I, might, I have a political opinions, but I, like, I've not, let's say, take the Trump administration, right? There's enough comments about the Trump administration in the news every single day that I, I don't need to spend time talking about that, but I can talk about trade policy or immigration or talk about the economic consequences of political discussions without necessarily being political or partisan. And so I, I've tried to, to do that. And, and that's a learning process. You realize, for example, I, I shared in a recent episode, maybe at the very end of a podcast, about five minutes on the whole concept of privilege. And I realized, you know, based on, and I had people that oh, we really enjoyed your comments. I had people quit my membership site and said, how dare you lecture me, which I've, I've never lectured on my podcast, but it, and I realized in talking to other associates, like, what could I have done better? And you realize that that's too important of a topic to spend five minutes on. That's an entire episode. And then it's a question, is that the type of episode that, that I want to do? Does it have an economic consequence? Or does it about money investing in the economy? And so take it from that frame. So I think part of it is learning to filter and not just say whatever comes up, but figure out you know, how does it fit with what listeners expect from from my brand with while still being authentic and so you know i still might like climate change i've talked about climate change because climate change is having more of an economic impact and an investing impact and but i think there's a way to to approach it in a way that's more even-handed even if i share an opinion in fact i had one guy after that privilege episode that says I, your platform is not the medium to share your opinion And I thought, well, no, actually, this is my podcast. I'm allowed to do that. But there's a way to do that in a way that isn't, that's constructive and helpful to people so they can learn and make their own decisions. And they don't feel like that they're being lectured at because that's not something that I want to do. Yeah, it's a a tough time, right? I mean, you started off earlier talking about there's a lot of angry people out there. And so I I found that uh, debate has often gone out the window and just a lot of a lot of people yelling on both sides but you're right and i think that's a good good way to approach your podcast through the lens of economics which is is hopefully a political and and more more factual 
is we we talk about um, all of this and how this is developed from from you retire from FEG, try a few different businesses. A couple of years later, you try a this podcasting thing, and you know you get a little traction. Later, dabble in YouTube, write a book. I've admired that you've done a lot of different things. What does the journey for David Stein look like now? What's what's next for you? Well, professionally this year, I'm very focused on upgrading the video content on my membership community. So you realize I've been investing for several decades. Is there a way that I can describe and teach investing better? And so do it in and so I've in some of my videos were, you know, shot for four or five years ago. And so I've I'm going through, I have a whole asset allocation and portfolio tools section of my website. So spending way more time, like what's the best content that I could put out on that topic to take a beginner or an advanced investor and walk them through step-by-step to build an investment portfolio. So that that's what's driving me professionally now, as well as, you know, put, put out a solid podcast every week, actually two podcasts. I do a, a free podcast and then a premium podcast. For, uh, outside of that, you know, I spend a lot of time fly fishing my FEG clients. Those that fish can never understand why I lived in Idaho. Some of the best trout springs in the world are trout rivers and I don't fly fish. And so when I, when I quit FEG, I learned to fly fish, spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, LaPro and I spent a lot of time hiking, camping, and just getting out as well as reading good books. Well, I'm jealous and, and uh, good luck recording some of those videos, those, those videos from a few years ago that you probably didn't have that great of a beard back then. Is this a, you, you, probably the beard is more fully grown, so the, the, the look will be definitely be different. We've learned a lot, I've learned a lot, and who knew there was a podcast reviewing other podcasts. Uh, this has been uh, this has been both fun and, and entertaining. So we really thank you, David, for, for your time and, and coming on here. Oh, no problem, it's good to be here. And, and in, he, that guy that did the podcast, I wrote him. And, you know, he, he actually apologized because <laughs> he felt bad <laughs> afterwards and, and shut down his podcast eventually. But I learned from it and I got better. And that's what we do in investing. We, we learn from our mistakes and we get better. We're humble about it and we just keep trying to improve. Well, that's great. Well, thanks again, David. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to our communications at www.feg.com backslash subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Please keep in mind that this information is intended to be general education that needs to be framed within the unique risk and return objectives of each client. Therefore, nobody should consider these FEG recommendations. This podcast was prepared by FEG. Neither the information nor any opinion expressed in this podcast constitutes an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy or sell any securities. The views or opinions expressed by guest speakers are solely their own and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of FEG.